Well, good morning again. We're, we're so glad you're here today, and um, we are. We do wish all you dads a happy Father's Day. I pray if you didn't get breakfast, maybe you're going to get a really great dinner, um, maybe something you really like. Um, that's always a fun time to be together. We're glad you're here today. Aren't you glad it's Sunday? I just, that's so many times during the week, it's like, oh, Sunday's coming. If I could just get to Sunday. Especially weeks like this. Um, I just came back Friday from a week with middle schoolers at camp. I am really glad it's Sunday. I was really glad when it was Friday, and they all packed their bags and went home. That was really exciting. It was a great week. Um, the reason I'm telling you about this, I see a few of our girls sitting here, and there's a guy sitting, a couple guys, some more girls sitting over here. Um, I want you to remember our young people. Think about them. Pray for them. They, they got a tough go at it. Um, wow. The stuff they are dealing with, it's big stuff. Um, it was a great week. Like two hours of sleep is awesome for five days. You should try it sometime. I will take a nap today. I will. Um, the coolest thing that happened was God showed up. Man, he showed up big time. And the kids responded. They knew he was there and they were listening as the best a middle schooler can listen. One ch a child, some adult said to a kid, you guys are acting like middle schoolers. And the kid went, we are middle schoolers. I was like, oh, that explains it, finally. The kids are smart. They know that they're middle schoolers. But it was a great time. I'm taking my ear plugs next time because um, there was some really loud music. But there were some great messages. Um, we had a ton of fun. Um, it was just a great time to be together. So last week, we began looking into the book of 1 Samuel. In our staff meetings, we've kind of jokingly called this Summer with Sammy. And um, Pastor Patrick started that off last week, and I'm going to continue with that today, and that's going to go um, a few more weeks. And we're excited about that. It's always fun to kind of get in a book and sort of see where it's going to go. Um, so I want to review just for a few minutes, whether you were here last week or you weren't, and probably for a lot of you this story is very familiar. You know who Saul is, you know who Samuel is, you know who David is. But if you don't, um, we're going to kind of recap a little bit of what happened um, from last week to where we're coming now. Think back with me. God has appointed a group of people to be his people. And he has named them Israelites. They're his chosen people. And in doing so, God has appointed himself as their king. He's the one that will lead them. He's the one that's chosen them, that set them apart for his purpose. He's, he's been faithful to them. And at times... They've been faithful to him. At other times, not so much. As we get into the book of Samuel, we see a point in their history where they get a little antsy about um, how their uh, leadership is working out. And they decide that they need a king. Not the king, but a king. They want a person to be their king. And at first, God's response to them is, nah. I got the king thing taken care of. I am the king. I've, I've got it taken care of. Well, people do as people do. And I know none of us do this now. They thought they knew better than God. We don't ever do that, right? But they decided they knew better than God, and so they just kept on. Like your three-year-old that wants four cookies, and you told them they could have two, and they just keep on and on and on. And they said, we want a king, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. Has your teenager ever said that? I have to have those shoes because I have to be like everyone else. Yes, amen. They had to be like everyone else. So finally, God says, okay, I'll, let you, I'll appoint a king. And in doing that, he sends his friend Samuel to give them a warning of what that's going to mean. So he's not going to blindly give them a king. He's going to give them a king, but it is going to come with a warning label of what's going to happen. 
Have you ever done that? Think about that with your teenager where they begged you for something and you told them no and then finally you said, okay, I'll give it to you, but here's what's going to happen. Have you ever done that? Or like Halloween, you say if you eat that whole bucket of candy, you will throw up. Right? And they're like, oh, but I mean it anyway. He told them what was going to happen. And Pastor Patrick summed it up in one word. This king was going to take. He was going to take everything they had. That was all he, he was just going to take. And take is what he did. He was pretty good at taking. He was really good at taking. So God did as God said he would do. And he anointed a king for the nation of Israel. And his name was Saul. So King Saul on the throne. And at times Saul was obedient. He knew who God was. He, he sometimes tried to follow God. And sometimes he was successful in what he was doing. Many times, though, we see Saul was not obedient. Even the story that sort of precedes this portion of Scripture that we're going to look in today is a great example of when he thinks he's partially obeyed God. Partial obedience is disobedience. And Saul finds that out the hard way. Saul, had, Saul wanted to do things one way, and that was Saul's way. He, he thought more of himself than he thought of God. And eventually, God told Samuel, Oh, I am grieved that I have made him king of Israel. I regret that I have made him king of Israel. He was sad. And so where we're going to pick up the story again this morning, we're going to see again where God tells Samuel, I regret making him king. And in so doing, I'm not going to abort the plan, but I'm going to well, find a new king. I'm going, to anoint, I'm going to have you go and anoint for me another king that will assume the throne. So we see... As we look in this portion of scripture, we're going to see God taking circumstances that aren't going exactly the way he meant, meant them to. And he says, I can work with that. I can do something with that. It's not what I intended. It's not what I wanted. But I can do something with that. So if you would, if you'd stand um, just one more time in honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to begin. Um, we're in 1 Samuel and it'll be chapter 15, verse 34, and then we're going to continue into chapter 16 through verse 13. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things human beings look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. 
Jesse, had the, Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came on David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Father, we thank you for your word and um, I pray that you would just open our hearts and our ears and our minds to what you would have to say um, to each one of us and that the words out of my mouth would be not Elizabeth's words, but your words. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the king God has appointed for Israel, he just, he hasn't worked out so well. Saul was not always a nice person. And he often made some pretty poor choices. We've seen that already. And if you keep reading through 1 and 2 Samuel, which maybe, maybe you'll do that this afternoon or as the week goes along, you're going to see that he continues to make a lot of bad choices um, and continues to not be a very nice person. God was grieved. He was sad. He was disappointed. He had chosen Saul, and Saul's let him down. Have you ever found yourself disappointed, sad, grieved over a situation? I'm pretty sure if you're in this place and you're upright and breathing, the answer would be yes. You've been disappointed. You've, you've been sad. Have you ever seen something or been a part of something that you know was right? You know it was a good thing? You know it was a God-inspired thing? And then it takes a turn? And I don't mean a turn for, oh, great, that's better, but a turn for, oh, no, that's not good? Have you ever, have you ever experienced that? Seen that? We've all been disappointed. And at times, we've all disappointed someone. We've been on both sides of that equation. And sadly, not only have we disappointed people, but most likely all of us at some point in our life have disappointed God. When he's asked us to do something, and we either just blatantly didn't do it, we halfway did it, or we just pretended like we didn't hear him anyway, and we've disappointed God. He's called us. He's appointed us. And unfortunately, at times, we disappoint him. So what? We're human. We make mistakes. So what? Besides the fact that most likely disobeying and disappointing the creator of the universe is probably not the best idea. So what? I think chapter 16 really gets to the so what. God stands ready at all times to work with that. He looks around at our disappointments and our failures and our mess-ups, whether it's what we've done or has been done to us, and he says, I can do something with that. I can work with that. We see that right here. He's chosen a king. This king has not been what God would have chosen for him to be. He was no less chosen. He just hadn't lived up to what God needed him to do, what God wanted him to do, what God asked him to do. But God's not going to give up. He says, I can do something with this. I can do something with this. God's grieved. God is regretting having Saul as king. Not only is God disappointed in this, 
Samuel, we see at the end of 15 where he leaves, Saul leaves, and Samuel never sees him again. They part ways. Samuel is in mourning for Saul. And not in mourning of his death. He is mourning Saul's life. Samuel had lived life with Saul. He had mentored him. He had guided him. He tried to guide him. He had interceded for him to the Father. Hey, God, help Saul here. He had lived life with him. And Saul disappointed him. And Samuel is mourning. God is mourning. Samuel is so sad that Saul has just failed miserably. And then we see an interesting turn. God says in verse 1 of chapter 16, How long will you mourn for Saul? Elizabeth paraphrased, How long are you going to sit around here and mope for him because he's the one that messed up? Watch what I can do with this. Samuel is told, fill up that horn with oil, and I'm sending you to anoint the next king of Israel. And God doesn't do that without honoring this mourning time. God's still in the business of that today. Have you been disappointed? Broken hearted? Have you disappointed someone and you needed time? Time either for yourself to heal or that person needed time. Mourning. Mourning doesn't always just involve death. Sometimes we mourn things in life and we need time. And we see here God honors that. God gives Samuel some time to mourn Saul. He knows that they, they lived life together. He doesn't belittle that. But then there comes a point in this scripture, as well as in our lives, where God says, okay, the morning is over. Pick up that horn with the oil and let's get back to business. And maybe he's not telling us today that, hey, I want you to pick up a horn of oil and go pour it on someone's head. But he is saying, he often says the same to us. Morning's over. It's time to get back to doing my business. He honors that time, but then there comes a point where God says, okay, it's time to get going again. So the Lord sends Samuel off to anoint another king. Let's think about this for just a minute, though. Saul remains king of Israel. This anointing is not going to displace Saul and David's going to come in as the king. Saul is continuing to reign, and he will continue to reign until his death. So we're gonna, we see here, God says, horn, get your horn filled with oil. You're going to anoint the new king. You're going to see Jesse of Bethlehem, and one of his sons is it. And Samuel's response is, oh, no, I'm not, because Saul will kill me. You can see where he would get this in his head. This, this king still reigns. And yet, God's asking him to go get a new king, and he knows Saul is not going to take kindly to that, as would any other king. Interestingly enough, God's response back to his argument is just further direction. Has that ever happened to you? God called you to do something, and you had some great reasons why you shouldn't do it. I'll give you an example. VBS. Woo. God said, why don't you sign up for VBS? There's some of those children that they're going to need your attention. That last week of July, not quite last, third to last, whatever. I want you to do that. I don't like children. I don't want to do that. Those children will kill me. I can't do it. And God says, no, I want you to go back there and put your name on that paper. God still does that. He skips right over our excuses and gets right down to what his directions are for us. 
He doesn't take real kindly to excuses. He gets right down to business of what he needs Samuel to do. Think of, let's think of a biblical example of where this happened. Jonah. God said to Jonah, clearly, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah just as clearly said back to God, oh, no, I'm not. I don't like them. They don't like me, and I'm not going. Okay. The next thing you know, Jonah finds himself in the belly of a big old fish. And then, lo and behold, where does Jonah end up? In Nineveh. Because God didn't take very kindly to his excuses of, well, I don't like them, and they don't like me, and I'm not going. God still, his plan remains supreme. The same is true here. It's not that he's belittling Samuel's feelings because God gave us feelings and he acknowledges our feelings, but he does not want us to live based on our feelings because our feelings will get us in big time trouble. Amen. So he says, he just skips over and just gets right into what he has for him to do. So Samuel is to go and see Jesse and appoint one of his sons as the next king. So off Samuel goes to make a house call. Gets his horn, it's filled with oil, and off he goes. So he arrives at Jesse's home, and as would have been culturally acceptable then, and probably even now, the first son that Jesse brings before Samuel is the oldest. He's grown, he's, I mean, he's kingly looking, so it, it seems right in their minds that he would be the one. It has... That's how their culture worked, the oldest, right? They had a birthright. They, that, was, that was how it went, the oldest. Immediately, God says, that's not him. He might look great, and I understand that you like the way he looks, but that's not him. God's done that in a few other places. Think about some other stories that we know. Jacob and Esau. Esau was the oldest, Jacob the younger. Their roles got reversed. Joseph and his older brothers, who then bowed down to him. God has a way of um, messing up what we think makes sense. Has he ever done that to you? He's taken what you know is right and went bloop and turned that upside down. God has a way of doing that. And he does that here. So one by one, through seven sons, God says, nope, it's not him. Nope, it's not him. And so I imagine Samuel when he says, Do, are there any more sons? Kind of this, like he's looking at Jesse going and looking at God and looking at Jesse and like something, I'm missing something here. Do you have any more sons? Oh, yeah. What, I mean, isn't that great? Is David like, oh, yeah, I do have that one more. You know, I got that one way out there that I forgot about. And he's like, yeah, I do. And Samuel, because he's heard what God has said, I am choosing a son from, the, from Jesse. God says, or Samuel says, you go get him and bring him back. Because he, Samuel knows all the other seven haven't been the one. Process of elimination here is that number eight coming out of the field has to be the one. So they do. They send for him. And he comes. So here comes David, the youngest son of Jesse. So imagine with me the scene for just a minute as David comes in. One of my favorite things to do when I read scripture is to imagine how it smells. I know that sounds really gross, but I do. I don't know why. Do you think David smelled very good? He was out tending sheep, and he smelled like sheep. It's not a very pleasant aroma. So first of all, David shows up, and he doesn't smell very good. Second of all, David's just a kid. He's not like a grown-up man that's all kingly walking in. He's just a boy, preteen at best. Here he comes. We are told, though, that he looks healthy. That's pretty significant, considering in this day and age there would have been a lot of kids that that would not have been the case. Nutrition was not what it is today. Um, kids, their lifespan was not what we have today. So for him to be um, pointed out as being healthy is significant. He also, it says he has a fine appearance, and all I could think was 
he would have been a catch at middle school camp. <laughs> Every girl would have wanted that as their camp boyfriend. Because, you know, they all have to have a camp boyfriend. But he would have been the one to get. They would have, like, radared in on him the first minute they drove up. He was a cute kid. He had a lot of potential. Good-looking boy. And all this is, has happened before um, David's met up with Goliath. Okay? And we know, any of us that know the story of Goliath, which you will, if you don't know it now, you're going to know it next week. Um, he, was, he was still a kid then when he meets up with this giant. And that hasn't even happened yet at this point in Scripture. So he's told in verse 12, This is him. Pour that oil on his head because this is the one. That's Elizabeth paraphrase. I just love this. There's no question what God is saying. There's no, there's no room for any discussion. It's that's him, you anoint him, he's the one. I really like it when God does that. That always makes me feel better. And the cool thing is God really does do that. We're told in Scripture, think of John 15, verse 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. God chose us. He made no mistake. Each and every one of us. He said, yep, that's the one. That's the one I choose. He made no mistake. The Lord looks at each and every one of us, you, me, and he says, I can do something with that. He looks at our failures, our disappointments, our mistakes, our junk, and he says, I can do something with that. I can do something with that. So we see Samuel obey God. At this, at, in this moment, he doesn't question, like, are you really sure that's the one? Or aren't you sure you don't want one of those? He, he anoints him right then. Samuel does what God's told him to do. And then we're told, love this part, the Spirit of the Lord comes on David. Quick Trinity lesson. God has always existed as three beings. Always. He has always existed as God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, just in case you weren't positive, Jesus does not just show up in Matthew. He existed in Genesis. Okay? The Holy Spirit. He doesn't just show up when we hung up the red banners and called it Pentecost. He existed in Genesis 1-1. He existed always. Now the difference in the Old Testament with the Spirit and with Jesus, Jesus had not been born to the Virgin Mary yet. He still existed, but he had not come to live his earthly ministry yet. The Holy Spirit had not come to all people at this point, but there were times when the Spirit came on specific individuals. He even came on Saul. God recognized that whomever he would appoint as the king of Israel was going to need help. He was going to need the Spirit of God with him, on him, in him, all the time. And not that God didn't recognize that other people would need it until the moment of Pentecost. That's not what I'm saying. It's just part of how God's plan has played itself out. And someday when we get to heaven, he'll explain all that to us. Why he's done it the way he has. Or we won't care to know how he's done it. But we know that at this moment, the Spirit of God comes on David in power. I love that word, power. God empowered him the same as he empowers us. And I think about the scripture in Ephesians that talks about how he empowers us with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And I've said it a thousand times, but I'll say it again. I really believe that's got to be enough power to get done what God needs done through just pe people like us. That's a lot of power. So we come to the end of this portion of chapter 16, and here's what we have. We've got a young boy with oil in his head who probably does not have one clue what's happening to him. We Secondly, we've got a king, Saul, who still sits on his earthly throne who thinks he has power but really doesn't have any power because God's removed himself from him. And then we see this priest, Samuel, 
who's initially wasn't so sure he wanted to obey, but he does. He obeys, and now he's back off to go back to doing what priests do, going back to business. David has been anointed to become the next king of Israel. God has moved one step closer to fulfilling his plan for humankind. Good news for us is even today, God has moved one step closer to fulfilling his plan for humankind. And he does that through us. He has chosen us. He has appointed us to live out what he needs to this world that we live in. He looks around. He looks at all of us. He looks at every part of who we are, everything we've ever done, and he says, I can do something with that. If you will allow me, I can do amazing stuff with that. He says, I've chosen you. I have anointed you. And I have put my spirit in you. God is still working. God is still moving. God is still acting and creating. And he really wants to do all those things with all of us. But luckily, he'll do them in spite of us. We see that with Saul. Saul messed up. But that did not derail God's plan. God continued on in spite of what people do. The same is still true. He wants us. He chose us. He can't wait to say to us, I can do something with that. But he will continue his plan. So today, what will your response be? I feel very strongly that every time we open his word and every time we hear it proclaimed, it deserves a response. This is alive. It is active. It is a breathing being. It deserves a response. Will you be like David and accept your anointing? Accept the Holy Spirit in your life? Even though you may be young or... You may be young in your faith or you may just not know what in the world God has for you. But would you accept it? Step out in faith that, okay, he's better, he knows better than I do. Will you be like Samuel and obey? Even when it, you feel like your life is at stake? Will you obey? I pray none of us will be like Saul, who God appoints us and then we just turn our back and say, I'm doing my own thing. I pray none of us will be like that. As you think of your life, and maybe you walked in this place this morning, and your life is just covered up in garbage, can you hear God saying, I can work with that? Will you allow yourself to hear God saying that? Because He so wants to. He's speaking that to you. He wants you to hear it. He can do something with that. We're told, I, I love the scripture in Romans where he tells us that he's working all this stuff to the good of those who love him. Not that everything is good. We have bad stuff in our lives. But he can take everything and he can turn it into something beautiful. He is beautiful. Can you hear him saying, I can work with that.